I barreled my way through the night, praying the engine of my old Impala wouldn't give ghost from the hard ride. Day was breaking as I crossed Lake Pontchartrain. train. It glowed yellow with the rising sun, but in truth it was a cesspool brown the closer I got to the city. Benoit had just told me to get to the French Quarter and call a phone number when I got there. Now the French Quarter wasn't quite the tourist mecca it is today, but it was still pretty popular, especially with service members on shore leave looking for cheap thrills. It was seedy as hell. But a city like that can be a blessing in disguise for men in my situation. Seedy cities are easy to disappear in if needed, and there's usually some unscrupulous ex-service member willing to sell you some extra firepower. And who was I to judge an unscrupulous man? I had just fled a fucking murder scene. I parked the car near a payphone and got out. I fumbled with some change and dialed the number Benoit had given me. The phone rang for what felt like a lifetime. Then someone picked up. It's me, I'm here. I said, not giving any other details. It's good to hear your voice. I thought something might have happened to you on the road. Came Benoit's relieved response. Yeah, well, something did happen to me on the road. I'll fill you in when I see you. I replied while looking around the street through the dirty glass. Benoit gave me an address a couple blocks away. He didn't say anything else over the phone. I drove the car over to the address. It wasn't a quiet side street. When I arrived at the address, I thought I must have been mistaken. It was a small, weird store and not an apartment building. Mary's General Goods and Supplies. Strangest general goods store I'd ever seen. Black drapes covered the windows and there wasn't much sign of life. I pushed the door with apprehension. A small bell rang and I was hit by the smell of burning herbs. I walked into the store. It was filled with antiques and what I would refer to as voodoo shit. Although I never quite grasped the difference between hoodoo, voodoo and all those other African religions. You made it! Benoit emerged from behind the counter with a look of relief on his face. He walked over and hugged me, beating his hand on my back so firmly it knocked the air out of my lungs a little. <laughs> Take it easy, <laughs> you'll break a rib. I said, laughing a little. Sorry, it's just good to see you. He replied, releasing me. You hadn't called in a few days, I thought you might not make it. I almost didn't, something happened to me while I was on the road, I replied. Now, I wanted to fill Benoit in on all of the details of my trip, but I was more perplexed by the shop we were standing in. Mary's? Who owns this place, your sister? I inquired, puzzled. It was my grandmother's. My sister is named after her. She died after we were shipped out to Vietnam. My sister looked after the place while I was away. Almost as soon as I was home, she moved to LA. She has a notion to become a singer. My grandmother left her some money and I got the creepy shop. Benoit said while sweeping his arm across the selection of word merchandise in the shop. And people buy this stuff? I said, pointing at an old selection of herbs. Wow, well, business is good. The shop is kind of discreet, so the tourists think they found some genuine secret voodoo shop. Don't worry, 95% of this stuff is completely harmless. Benoit said, smiling. And the other 5%? I skeptically inquired. Yeah, that stuff's not for tourists. I keep those items in the back storeroom, along with an item I got in the mail. Speaking of which, what happened to you on the road? Benoit walked over to the door and locked it. I filled Benoit in on the hospital in Japan, the statuette and the woman at the motel. The only details I left out was the murder of the motel owner and the whispers. I didn't want to freak him out or involve him in a murder I might get accused of. Benoit listened, looking concerned. I got the same statuette in the mail. It was sent to my old address, so I don't know how long it had been there. Probably since I got back from Vietnam. There's no way to know for sure, it had no postmark. Once I got it, I called you straight away. I got worried about the statuette, so uh, I checked all the books here in the shop to see if any of them had any details on the statue, or the woman in it. But I turned up nothing. Benoit continued. I was stumped, so I called the university at Baton Rouge. They pointed me in the direction of a retired professor, some expert in uh, ancient religions. So I paid him a visit, he lives about an hour from here in the middle of nowhere. Nice house, but uh, the land is practically a swamp. 
So, did he recognize the statue? I asked on tenterhooks. Kinda. He said that it wasn't really African or American. This statuette is a crude modern replica, but the woman depicted was probably the Silent Mother. Some ancient god people worshipped in coastal communities the world over. But her religion probably died away at least a millennia ago. Apparently she can grant her followers eternal bliss if they worship at her temple. Trouble is, no one knows where her temple is. According to the professor, it probably doesn't exist. He told me to give him a couple of days to do more research. Those people in the tunnel sure didn't look like they found eternal bliss. Then again, it didn't look like a temple either, just a small shrine, I mused. And did he get back to you? And uh, that was a couple of days ago. I rang him all morning, but he's not answering the phone, Benoit responded. Oh shit, we gotta drive over there, now, and bring a weapon, I said, putting on my jacket. Shouldn't we just give him another day? Benoit said, perplexed. He may not have another day, Benoit, I said as we walked out the door. Benoit locked it behind him, setting the sign to closed. We drove out of the city to the west in Benoit's car. It was sweltering. In the tunnel in Vietnam, I thought you said you had seen something like that before, I probed Benoit. Well, I was embellishing a little. Look, when I was 14, a local councillor was accused of some pretty serious stuff. Several local women made some serious allegations about the guy. But he was quite and powerful, and so he was able to buy his way out of trouble. But the locals weren't satisfied with that outcome. One night, my grandmother drove me out to the middle of nowhere, to a sort of... ceremony. My memory of the event is kinda hazy. There were a lot of people chanting, and there was this voodoo priest. They forced the counselor to drink this weird liquid. The counselor's eyes took on a sort of dead-eyed look. Like the lights were on, but nobody was home. After that, the counselor responded to the shaman's every command. Walk, smile, jump. He was like a puppet. And then they just released him, and off he wandered into the night. The cops eventually found him and brought him home. According to newspaper reports, he seemed fine, if a little confused. He certainly didn't talk about any ceremony. A couple of days later, according to the same reports, he got a phone call at home. After the call, his wife saw him calmly walk into the kitchen, pick up a knife and stab himself in the throat. Jesus, fun story, Benoit. Way to lighten the mood, I said with a mental image in my head. So yeah, I didn't see exactly what we saw in the tunnels before, but I have seen some weirdly similar shit, Benoit said as he pressed down harder on the accelerator. We both sat in silence as he drove. After about an hour of driving, we turned off the small road onto an even smaller dirt track. Reeds grew high at the side of the road. The guy really did live in a swamp. Only a mile or so now, Benoit informed me as we bounced uncomfortably over the dirt road. As soon as he spoke, we saw a small column of smoke rising in the distance. Tell me that's not his house, I said, half hoping. His house is the only one on this road, Benoit replied with fear in his voice as we approached. The dirt track turned to gravel as we approached. It was a small old plantation house. Well, I say small, it was as small as plantation houses go, but still imposing. It was also very much a blaze. Thick plumes of black smoke were bellowing from the house, but the fire had not fully engulfed it. The fire had clearly been started recently. The car came to a halt on the grass lawn and we both hopped out. Benoit ran to the front porch. There was a barrel of rainwater near a gutter pipe. He dunked his head into it, drenching himself. He pulled a soaked t-shirt up over his mouth and nose. Are you fucking kidding? We're not going in there, I roared. I'm not leaving the guy to burn to death. I got him into this mess. Benoit replied, his voice muffled by the t-shirt. I hesitated for a second and then followed Benoit's lead, dunked my head into the barrel. We both stood at the doorway, our faces covered and ready to enter. This isn't going to end well, I thought, as Benoit kicked in the door. The heat was incredible, smoke was filling the house. Luckily those old houses had pretty high ceilings, so the smoke set like an ominous black blanket above our heads. Soon it would fill the house, and our lungs if we weren't careful. 
Benoit led the way. His study is in the back, that's where he works! Benoit shouted through his t-shirt. We made our way quickly to the study. Benoit felt the door to check if it was hot. It's warm, keep to the side, Benoit said as he quickly kicked the door and then ducked to the left of the door frame. Luckily, there was no backdraft. The room was ablaze, but it hadn't burned up all the oxygen. Flames engulfed the ceiling and licked the walls. Then we spotted him. The professor lay dead in his chair, head slumped on his large wooden desk, a pool of blood pouring from his throat, and two shards of glass protruding from his eye sockets.